Heights Planning Commission meeting. We'll go ahead and begin. Uh, we'll start first with our approval of the minutes for June 13th, 2018. We'll entertain a motion to pass those. I'll move we approve the minutes. Motion by Maureen. Is there a second? No, it's complicated. I'll go ahead and second. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, we'll go ahead and vote. Brenda? Yes. Matt? Yes. Carolyn? Abstain. Maureen? Yes. Andreas? I vote yes. And Clark? Yes. That passes. Moving on to the report of the chair and the vice chair. I have nothing to report. I have nothing to report. And Wayne? Um, I do have a couple of things. I'm not sure if um, at your last meeting, if um, Molly Robinson was introduced. Uh, does that ring a bell? If not, then I would like to introduce Molly. Um, you, you already know Molly. She was the urban designer in our office, but she's been recently promoted to planning manager. Cool. So you will see her sitting up here at the table here shortly by herself. <laughs> um, Congratulations. One other thing, or two other things. One, um, I'd like to try to get a head count for uh, the meeting on July 25th. We know that that's the day after July 24th. Um, we've sent out some, uh, you know, questions on if you could make it, but we haven't received info from everyone, and we're not sure if we'll have a quorum. So we want to see if we're going to even have that meeting. So I, I don't know if we could maybe get a head count for those of you that are here now. Maybe raise your hand if you will be here July 25th. Okay, so we're at three. All right, so we may not have a meeting July 25th. We'll check with the, actually, I, I don't think we would even have enough to make a quorum that meeting. So we'll probably be canceling that meeting. Uh, we'll let you know for sure though. Okay. Um, one last item is we're gonna start to revisit our staff reports a little bit and just make sure that they're accomplishing what everyone needs uh, them to accomplish and um, try to simplify them if, if possible. Um, I know you recently had a discussion uh, with Nick about some thoughts on staff reports. Uh, I was just hoping maybe in our next round of uh, review for our next meeting when you're reading through the staff reports, if you could kind of take some mental notes about what might be working, what's not working, how we can improve getting the information to you in an easier manner. Um, and just, in, you know, instead of, we can do it, have the discussion in a meeting, but I think it might be almost easier if you can kind of jot down those thoughts and maybe email them to me, um, and then we'll kind of go from there. I'm doing the same thing with the staff, and I would like to do the same thing with all the commission members too, so. Great. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Molly. Uh, all right, we will move on to our first uh, item on the agenda. Um, this is um, our, some other business, not public hearing, for the Bishop's Place, uh, Bishop Place Plan Development Approval Time Extension. All right, Hi, thank you. Um, so again, this is the, a request for a time extension for the Bishop Place Plan Development. Um, you can see uh, it's shown on the screen. It's located at approximately 432 North and 300 West. This development was approved in 2014 by this commission, and um, this is the fourth time extension that they have requested. The development involved the redevelopment of a historic cul-de-sac called Bishop Place, um, or also it's a court development, and the rehabilitation of the homes on this street. Um, it included 12 properties and involved modifying setbacks to help them build additions to the back to make some of these structures more livable. Um, it also involved approving a narrower street, Bishop Place, um, so there would be some widening, but it was narrower than what would normally be approved. Um, the developer did ultimately decide that it was phys uh, financially difficult to make this development work, and they've requested approval from the Historic Landmark Commission to demolish the structures and start over um, through the economic hardship process. And that application is pending a decision by the Historic Landmarks Commission. However, the developer is still requesting to maintain their original approval for the development, and we are recommending approval of the time extension in case the developer does decide to go with the original plan, as we want to encourage restoring and rehabilitating these historic homes, and we don't want to disincentivize their preservation by eliminating this option. So that's that for, for me. Um, the developer is here in case there's any questions for him, but he doesn't have a presentation. So if, if we approve the extension and they are able to get the demolition permit and they demolish, then our 
approval is gone. It would go away at that point. Do something else or, okay. Yes. If, if they do get demolition approval from HLC and demolish the structures, the plan development is, is null and void because it was contingent on them preserving these structures. So you're making the argument that if we uh, agree to extend, then we are encouraging the salvaging of the buildings. Keeping that option open for them. Okay. So is it, more, is it just keeping the option open, or if we voted against this, would, they, would the HLC then look at it as they don't have another option and they need to resolve things that way? Um, they, they could potentially still go through the plan development process again, um, but it would be another process that they'd have to go through uh, more time. Um, I don't know if that's specifically a consideration at this point through the economic hardship process, but um, just keep in mind that the developer would face another process with the Planning Commission. They're going through a very specific economic development hardship process right now, and, and whatever happens here isn't part of that process at all or that consideration. What constitutes economic hardship? <laughs> Money? It, it does go to money. Um, I don't know if, if Wayne probably is better explaining this than I am. It's, it's a really, <laughs> it's probably a much more complicated explanation than we can get into uh, this evening, but it, it, it kind of goes uh, into the takings issue on if, if there's a, a takings associated, um, if the city denies demolition, there's an economic review panel that's formed to review uh, the economics of um, what they can do with the structures intact versus, uh, you know, you know what, what it would take to, to make it so that the structures are, are actually usable versus demolishing those structures. Uh, there's a lot of mathematical formulas that go into that. Um, and then the economic review panel makes a recommendation uh, based on very specific standards that goes then back to the, the Historic Landmark commission, commission and they make a final decision based on that recommendation. Dan Daniel, what do you think would, what message would we, we be sending or what would we encourage the developer to do if we were to deny the extension? And I say that based on reading the um, Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council's letter. Sure. Um, encouraging us to do so. I don't know that it would encourage them to preserve the structures if, if we eliminated this option. They still have We'd, to go through historic landmarks. They if would. We, if we eliminate that. And, um, okay. So, so can we just talk this through, because I'm kind of confused. So if landmarks says you can't tear anything down, then this plan development would stand and, uh, and therefore um, it could or could not be developed, but at least it, it would be in place to sort of smooth the way for, for redevelopment of the existing properties. Right. If Landmark says no, if Landmark says yes, you can tear the buildings down, then the plan development goes away, and what would then be the status of the property? They, they would be starting from the beginning, essentially. Um, with a new development proposal. The so current zoning. The current zoning is SR3, which would allow for a number of townhomes. I believe the number is around 30 townhomes could be built on this property. Um, so it would have a higher density count than currently is on here because of the current structures. With the plant, with the, but that would, be, that would be assuming they would combine all the properties and there's no, there's no reason not to do that, right? As separate lots, as one lot. They would, if they demoed the properties, they would probably split these properties up um, to have more homes. I would expect that. That would be a subdivision? That would be a subdivision process. And if they wanted to have homes without public street frontage, um, it would be another plan development that would come back to this body. But a subdivision doesn't a, come back here. A subdivision, if they were actually putting in a full-size public street through this property, um, then it wouldn't come back to this body. Um, the buildings themselves would just go to the Historic Landmarks Commission. But I would expect, given, given the width of this property and the frontage, that they would probably do a private street, which would involve a plan development process and, and the Planning Commission. They would have to come back for, probably have to come back with a plan development process anyway. 
Right. So if I could just clarify, <laughs> they've already been to the, to the Landmark Commission asking for demolition, and that was denied. That denial has been challenged and um, is presently in third district court. Uh, it's all pending the outcome of the uh, economic hardship process, which may or may not conclude tomorrow night. Um, it's, it's been a long road, but the fact that there is litigation presently over the denial of the demolition, I think, lends support to the idea that extension is appropriate. Because? Because there are issues in the court that are yet to be determined. Um, it's, it's a process that uh, they are going through their uh, administrative rights to um, determine whether the Landmark Commission acted appropriately. So there's still, even if the Landmark Commission makes a decision tomorrow night, there's still a court, a court case is open that would keep the whole thing open still? Um, it's complicated because <laughs> what the Landmark Commission is supposed to do is to consider and accept or reject the uh, Economic Hardship Panel's recommendation. The recommendation was for six of the nine structures. The Landmark Commission's denial was based on the fact that what we have is an intact assemblage of late 1800s working, worker housing. So the, there are more conversations to be had about what is the impact of the hardship determination on the previous denial. And so th those are some issues we have to sort out. And again, hopefully we don't have to spend a whole lot of time in, in court or a whole lot more process. We've, this has been a long road, so um, here we are. It seems, it seems to me if, if they were already denied by landmarks and then we deny them, wouldn't that strengthen their court case? I, I think that the issues are independent because they are different uh, types of determinations. Um, I'm just trying to find in the staff report or either our original motion um, or where, where it just says that this is con the plan development is conditioned on keeping the structures or is it just because the way that the plans were drawn that that's what we're tied to because it, it's because of the plan development objectives and you have to meet certain objectives um, so we made findings for those objectives um, in the staff report and if they don't maintain their compliance with those objectives by demolishing all the buildings um, then they would lose that the right to keep this they would maintain proposal. they wouldn't maintain compliance with c but they maintain compliance with f elimination of blighted structures or incompatible uses to redevelopment rehabilitation let me say those structures aren't blighted structures is they're clearly blighted structures so they they they're specifically going for the preservation of historic structures um and the initial approval was based on that. Was based on that, yes. And not on any other. No. I mean, should we just if we just conditioned our motion tonight that the extensions contingent on the structures are not being dem, there's no demolition. Is that? I, I don't think you even have needed? to condition it because I don't. If the demolition happens, then this plan of development. I don't think it's necessary. With just because of all those findings it. in the staff report itself you, you the planning commission approved a development plan that shows keeping the existing structures and making the improvements that are on that development plan if the final plan they go uh, for building permit is different from that then it's 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 no longer part of the plan not just setbacks plan. and all those other sort exactly. of exactly you, you approve the development plan all right Okay. Uh, so if we give them the extension, there's a, at least they have the opportunity to preserve those structures. Correct. And if we don't, then who knows Turn what they'll over. have to do. Right. I'm the owner and I'm glad to um, Well, I don't, do we have any, do we, I don't, I think we're, I think we're probably okay. I think so. Um, I mean, I can make a motion if okay. do we need anything else or? I don't think so, unless you want to, if you're ready for a motion, you can go ahead. 
Uh, based on the information the staff uh, memo and the information presented, I move the commission approve the year-long time extension request for PLN SB uh, SUB 2014-0019 and PLN SUB 2014-00020 Bishop Place Plan Development at approximately 432 North 300 West. Okay, motion by Matt. I'll second. Second by Maureen. Uh, we'll go ahead and vote unless there's no other discussion. Okay, Clark. Aye. Andres. Um, I do hope that this is the last request for such a motion, uh, for such a, uh, a request, but uh, I will vote yes this time. Maureen. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Matt. Yes. And Brenda. Yes. All right. There you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. All right, moving on to uh, the next item, public hearing on zoning map amendment at approximately 1332 and 1334 East, 500 South. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Good evening. This is a request to rezone property at 1332 and 1334 East, 500 South. Um, the request is to rezone it from RMF 75 to RMU 45 and the intent is to allow for a future residential use with a commercial component. You can see on the left, the future land use map and the zoning map on the right. The subject property is shown in yellow and is on the south side of 500 South. It's located near the tracks line and southeast of the University of Utah. You can see on the future land use map that it's designated high density residential the property to the north is designated low density residential. And then on the zoning map on the right, again, the property is designated as RMF 75. The property to the north is RMF 30. To the northeast is the University of Utah. And then to the east is the Mount Olivet Cemetery, which is designated as open space. So the future land use map calls for high density residential. And the proposed zone change for residential mixed use fits within, the, fits within this category. So as part of the analysis for this project, staff looked at the compatibility with existing master plans. Um, this included the citywide plan Salt Lake plan, which looked at um, in the growth chapter and also the housing chapters, the location of the sites and um, having them in an area with existing infrastructure amenities, and this includes things like the transit line that's located nearby, and also having properties that have a mix of land use development, a mix of land uses, I'm sorry, and infill development on underutilized site, and the site is currently vacant, so this would provide infill in that area. Also looking at growing Salt Lake, the five-year housing plan, it seeks to increase housing options within the city and then more specific to this area, the Central Community Master Plan, which has policies that support a variety of land uses. Um, these include livable communities and neighborhoods that have a variety of land uses, also having unique and active places where people can socialize and gather, and a potential development for this site would include a mix of commercial and residential with the pr primary use being residential. And then, as I previously mentioned, um, this would implement the master plan land use category of high density residential. Another issue is the existing zoning limitations of the site. The site is a very small site. It's approximately 8,000 square feet, and it has about 50 feet for the width of the site. And so the existing zoning of RMF 75, which requires a minimum 9,000 square foot site for a multifamily use, and a minimum lot width of at least 80 feet um, limit the development on the site to essentially a single family home development. So the requested change from RMF 75 to RMU 45 would allow for the development to be consistent with the future land use map in the central community master plan. And so staff's recommendation for the zoning map amendment is to forward a recommendation to the city council to approve the request. Great, thank you. Any questions for Sarah? Okay. I mean, so just real quick in sum, I mean, essentially, I mean, they, they're losing some of their height require ability. Correct. So, but they're gaining the ability to put commercial units or commercial into the lower end of the building. Sure. And under RMF, you cannot do commercial. I mean, I'm looking at the, the, I like your comparison table. Thank you for including that, by the way, um, of the different zones. Sure. What's permitted and not. 
also, um, there are some differences as far as the setbacks as well. And the applicant is also here and has a presentation as well. And one other clar clarification, Commissioner, is that um, it would also allow more than just a single family residence as far as uh, the residential that would be permitted on the site. Because the RMAU 45 does not have a density limitation like the RMF 75 does. Make sense? But given the building's 30 minutes shorter, 30 feet shorter, wouldn't there be less people? No, so the RMF 75, all of our RMF zoning districts have very strict density limitations to where you can only put a certain number of dwelling units per square footage. In this case, it's only an 8,000 square foot lot, so you couldn't actually even put multifamily on this site, meaning three units or more, because you need at least 9,000 square feet to put a multifamily on this site. Um, the multifamily is how many units? Uh, three units or more. Three units or more. And with the RMU zones, with the R RMU 45, that we don't have that density limitation. We don't have that um, you know, dwelling unit per square foot. It's basically however you, many you can fit in the box and, and park it. Can I ask a question? Um, what about the TSA's zoning? How does that play into the RMF or RMU? Is it affected at all? Yeah, TSA is a whole different ballgame um, uh, with a, a different set of development standards. Um, generally, it's, it's quite a bit more intense um, and allows quite a bit more development potential than the RMU 45 zone. Thanks. Uh, RMF seems like a really dated zone. Uh, it's got tall buildings with large setbacks. It is, it is. And we're actually um, currently working on our RMF zones right now. Um, I don't know if you remember, we started, uh, or we were starting with a project where we were looking at lot width situations in our RMF zones because they really weren't working very well. Um, we've taken a little step back from that and we're actually looking at going a whole different direction with our RMF zones because the other issue is that they really don't have any design standards associated with them. Um, so we're actually, we're actually analyzing right now uh, the potential of doing our RMF zones more as form-based, um, which would add uh, some design criteria to those zones um, and try to get us out of that antiquated uh, zoning. It, it looks like it's a large, very tall buildings with oriented towards a car because of right. the size of 60%. Large, large setbacks, no mix of uses. Right. Right. Why, why is this not a transit zone? Um, and that think, it, how because it's all up for south, but did it end before we got up to? Yeah, it it, it ended at what about ninth east. Okay. Um, and it, the development pattern actually changes quite a bit once you get above yeah. there. Um, we do turn into more of a residential development pattern, um, even on fourth and fifth south at the you know S curve and above. There's a lot of single family homes, yeah. so it it changes quite a bit. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions before we bring the applicant up? Okay, we shall do that. Come on up. Where is it? Oh, this one right here. Oh. All right, I was looking for the... Uh... And if you can just give us your name and then of try course, to keep it yeah. under 10 minutes, that would be Oh, I'm going to try to keep it to three. Cool. We Even better. Home tonight. Even better. Um, 
So uh, my name is Ian Kaplan. Um, I'm the owner of AdVirtue Design and Development. It's a new startup development company here in Salt Lake. Um, I'm here with my partners, Cody Chamberlain with Decade Homes and uh, Jake with uh, Windermere Real Estate. Um, so obviously you guys know why we're here and I want to thank you guys for your time um, this evening. We'll see if I can get this to go full screen here. That's not going to work. All right. Well, so the parcel, as you guys know, is located next to the 15-story um, assisted living facility, or senior living facility, I should say, uh, Friendship Manor. And then it's also on the other side, we've got uh, the Mount Olivet Cemetery, and then it's located directly across from the track stop at University um, for the University Stadium. Uh, the two views that are kind of the primary views that you'll see. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with this thing here. All right, well. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, so yeah, uh, it's located next to the 15-story tall building, Mount Olivet on the, on the east side, and then the track stadium stop up here on the north. Uh, the two primary views are coming down from the university and then coming up 500 south, um, which, you know, Friendship Manor really kind of dominates that view at this point. Uh, the existing zone, um, RMF 75, you know, thank you, Sarah, for going through that and uh, Wayne for clarifying what the kind of restrictions are there. I'm going to just kind of briefly touch on them, even though I think they've kind of been hammered home at this point. So the allowed uses on the site, we've got um, multifamily dwellings, but because of the lot size, we cannot build a multifamily building, as Wayne was explaining. We've got... Um, uh, single-family attached dwellings, which we need a planned development because we have units that don't face a public right-of-way, so we'd have to go through planned development, but planned development also has this restriction where you have, a, have to have a minimum lot size of 9,000 square feet in order to submit. We don't meet that, so we can't go planned development, which also kills all of the other conditional use process that uh, we could potentially go through to make the site developable. And so that leaves us with the single-family um, detached dwelling but uh, I don't think the site necessarily lends itself well to a single family attached dwelling. Uh, if we look back on the site images, we're next to a 15 story assisted living facility in a graveyard. It kind of makes for an unfavorable development. So um, I think that's why we still have a vacant lot in our city. Um, and so what we're looking at is basically the sad story of a urban infill that never was and never will be, right? Um, and I think we, we all agree that urban infill is something that's gonna have to happen as the city densifies and as people move here. And, um, so looking at the overall land use map, um, the current land use map, you can see that uh, within a half mile of the site itself, uh, there's a very small commercial node up to the north that you see in red there, uh, which has like a bunch of pizza joints that basically serve the students, um, a couple other fast food joints. And uh, you know, a half mile is typically kind of the radius in which uh, people are willing to walk in an urban environment to reach a destination point, whether it's a coffee shop or a transit stop or something. And so um, what we're looking at is basically an area of the town that's not walkable. Uh, there's no real community services. There's no gathering places for community um, other than, you know, if you had more than a half a mile in either direction. So that's, that's kind of the intent of going to the RMU to offer some sort of commercial uh, viability to service the existing neighborhood and the residents that are there. Um, so what we're looking at is, you know, could it be a coffee shop, a gathering place? Um, we could also look at, you know, a small deli that services Friendship Manor, something that um, creates a walkable environment for the individuals that are living in Friendship Manor, gets them out of the building and, and off-site. Um, and then in terms of affordability, we can look at doing micro units on the residential side um, to offer some sort of affordability for um, kind of that missing middle that everybody's been talking about. And, uh, and then downsizing baby boomers, there's a huge real estate market right now that's moving into downsizing baby boomers, moving out of the suburbs, back into the city, smaller spaces, more urban environments. Um, and then of course, uh, we're so close to the university, there's an opportunity to maybe um, target tenure professors or even visiting professors, um, adjunct professors, people that kind of would like a nice space close to university and close to transit. Um, so our question is, you know, what, is, what does the city really want, right? Is it a, a vacant lot or um, is it a vibrant urban building? Um, and that's, that's kind of all I've got. So again, thank you guys for your time. All right, thanks. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, guess we're good. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, open the public hearing on this. Um, 
And uh, I do, well, actually first, we, if we have anybody from the community council um, that would like to speak, that is representing the community council. Come on up. And we do five minutes for our community council representatives, so you, you have that time. Hi, my name is Esther Hunter. I'm chair of the East Central Community Council and also the University Neighborhood Council. Um, we first of all want to applaud this applicant for reaching out to us early to really talk about how the community and the neighborhood felt about the development and that possibility. It's rare that developers do that and it's awesome when they do because you can sit and work out things ahead of time. Um, we did have a vote of our um, board, our executive board. Uh, 13 people voted. Everybody was in favor of that. The board represents the various neighborhoods as well as the executive officers. Um, we did not have a meeting in between. The applicant is meeting with us tomorrow at our meeting. Um, but we did not have a general community meeting that we were able to actually bring them in to. Um, we had a couple of dissenting worries, which mostly had to do about density in general and also the actual intended use. Um, being in the university neighborhood and always having conflicting issues between party houses and um, the neighborhood, that's something that we've just learned to work with and that doesn't really affect right now, but in the future when the applicant comes back for any exceptions um, for this, we've begun those conversations and that's what the board was just concerned about is that we are able to talk about that. We've talked about landscape and other things, buffers, the fact that this is a very senior complex next door with very aging and many different types of ailments that people have that we especially want to be respectful to the high rise and the things that they have there that it doesn't disrupt their life, their quality of life at this point. And so again, that isn't this zoning issue, but it is part of what the board brought up. But in general, again, it was a favorable vote. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Now we'll open it up to the general public. If anyone would like to come on up and speak, now is your chance. Just give us your name and then you have two minutes. Yes, hello, I'm uh, Roger Lamoni. I'm president of the Board of Trustees of Friendship Manor. And um, some of the faces here are familiar. It's similar to a development that was proposed a couple of years ago. Uh, at that time, they needed some right away from us. Um, our concerns remain for the impact of our residents uh, of Friendship Manor, um, especially the business component. We are concerned about uh, uh, parking and people parking in our lot, which is also shared with the First Unitarian Church and their preschool. And um, we are concerned about people simply driving through our parking lot, cutting across from 13th to 500 South to get to the property. Um, you know, there is no parking on that stretch of 500 South. And so we are not sure where the customer parking will be. It can't all be uh, walk-in traffic because that never seems to occur in Salt Lake City. So um, our concerns remain about the, who will be uh, living in that those micro units. Um, to us, it essentially is a multifamily development, a multi-unit development. So uh, that's our concerns. And my name is Elizabeth Waite. I'm also on the Board of Trustees of Friendship Manor. Um, I'm also a former small business owner in Salt Lake City. And at one point when we uh, converted the business from one use to another or expanded, we expanded the use. We turned a, a building behind the primary business into another business use. There was a real uh, question and a, and a delayed response because of the traffic flow and the use of uh, um, adequate parking. So it just made me aware of all of the considerations for traffic flow in and out of an area as well as sufficient parking for the um, proposed use of a space. Um, the space that I had had, um, the business that I owned, <clears throat> was um, a music studio where there were temporary, uh, there were people there for a short period of time and then leaving, so there wasn't a concentrated um, gathering of, of people um, during the, the weekday. It was also off of a street 
where there was a, a very easy two-way flow. And I don't know whether you're um, noticing the, f the traffic flow on the, in that particular area. Um, in that particular area, one can enter the property only from the east, and only if you're traveling east on 5th South. You can also enter the area only if you're traveling north on 13th East, and then there's a real temptation to enter the area through the parking lot of Friendship Manor. So there are two driveways into Friendship Manor um, parking area that I fully expect, just even from my own experience, would become utilized by people um, um, using the business, on using any business on this section. Um, the seniors in Friendship Manor cross uh, the driveway that accesses the, the parking for Friendship Manor. There's um, a smoking area that's on the east side of the parking lot from Friendship Manor where the residents go to smoke. So there's no smoking in Friendship Manor facility. And we've provided a stop sign and a walkway across the driveway to, to the Friendship Manor parking lot um, to a, a gazebo where they can smoke. That is, the par that is the driveway that one would enter to the Friendship Manor parking that we have every expectation, just because I've seen it from the point of view as a business owner, every expectation that people would either purposely or by mistake come into the Friendship Manor parking area and then provide that much um, less security for people from Friendship Manor simply going out to walk their pets or smoke. Friendship Manor is very self-contained. Uh, residents often don't leave the facility to go any place. They would not be probable patrons of any business across this, the road, the parking area, the driveway to that parking lot because there is, um, there are eating, there's an eating facility inside Friendship Manor and there's a, a, a garden facility. So it, Friendship Manor was designed for that purpose, to be self-contained. Um, and, and I thought I heard a timer. Did I hear a timer? So, thank you. But out of due respect, I was giving you, yeah, thank you. a little more time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else from the community who would like to speak on this matter? All right. Seeing none, we will go ahead and close the public hearing, and uh, bring it back up to the commission. See where we want to go from here. Maybe have Sarah come back up uh, at least. Do you have any questions? Uh, maybe you can address, um, I am very familiar with the, um, having taken my kids to the CCNS preschool at Unitarian Church for five years, I know that parking area very well. And thanks for letting the school use the parking, it's very important. Um, but I do know that it is complicated for the access and I can see, I can see some concern with utilizing the parking and the driveways, even if it's mistakenly and happening happening quite a bit so I'm assuming that this project would have to have um, access onto fifth south and it does currently or do they have to get permission from uh, UDOT to get a cutout to that street how does that work uh, there is currently a curb cut on to yeah. fifth south and with um, the preliminary plan that they submitted they're proposing maintaining that access onto fifth south and would they be able to, from your understanding with the width of the property, be able to have in and out? I mean, it is pretty skinny. So there it would be, I mean, people, they would, they would not have to in any way rely on um, the parking of the Friendship Manor to, to leave, correct? Correct. The plans that they've submitted thus far show, ha show them having in and out access. So it would be a, a right in, right out onto Fifth South. I, I think for tonight, I mean, our, I certainly have heard, I hear the community's concerns and think that we don't want people driving through and impacting there unnecessarily, but I think, I mean, we're looking at this not as this project, but more as this zone appropriate for this space. Um, I th and I think it's totally appropriate, I think it's one of the more straightforward ones that we've dealt with. It seems like a mixed use in this neighborhood is 
needed and would be helpful and would fit the master plan and a rezone even with the lower height seems to fit what's there and um, you know the rezone I think I think when they come forward with the development plans of their access to the property um, you know is a real concern and something that we, we want to make sure we take note of and, and manage and um, but you know access to neighboring properties is not a condition of you know zoning it's not it's not a really a standard we're reviewing here as what the you know but I think that the zone looks like it would would be positively impactful for the neighborhood in the area and it seems appropriate to the master plan and I'm supportive thanks yeah I, I mean I, I tend to agree I mean I think that um, I'm actually a little surprised that, that we don't have the transit even though there is single family up there it is there's a transit stop there and obviously we need to encourage density as much as we can around transit stops um, it's too bad a, a great development on the parking lot of the stadium didn't happen like we had all hoped. Right, Brenda? <laughs> okay. Um, any other comments or do we have a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion. Okay. <clears throat> Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment, file PLN PCM 2018-00256, proposed zone change from RMF 75, High Density Multifamily Residential District, to RMU 45, Residential Mixed Use Residential District, in order to allow the property be, to be developed with high density residential use. Okay. I'll second. Motion by Brenda, was that you, Maureen? Yep. And a second by Maureen. You're kind of a hot on the second today, aren't you? That's good. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and vote. Uh, Brenda? Yes. Matt? Oh, I'm sorry, Amy, you're here. You're here. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. I didn't have you on my list. Matt? Yes. Carolyn? Oh, great. Maureen? Yes. Andreas? I think it's a nice looking project, so yes. And Clark? Yes. All right. It passes. Good luck. Thanks. All right, moving on to our last item. Um, this is the single room occupancy SRO dwelling text amendment. Hi. Hello, good evening. Um, yes. So um, this evening I'll be covering some proposed uh, text amendments related to uh, single room occupancy dwellings, also referred to as SROs. Uh, the main purpose of these amendments is to better define the SRO dwelling use and also to expand the number of zoning districts where the use is permitted. Uh, the mayor initiated this petition with the intent of implementing elements of the growing SLC housing plan, which was formally adopted by council at the end of 2017. So first I just wanted to briefly discuss the SRO housing type and what it is. Um, it can generally be described as a structure or a part of a structure that contains individual rooms with combined sleeping and living areas. Um, kitchen and, and or toilet facilities are often included in the project as common spaces to be shared with other residents. Um, I pulled up just some images off the internet to try to illustrate what the SRO housing type might look like. Um, the top left is a picture um, of what could be a potential SRO layout with two individual units um, that contain their own sinks in the units, but they share um, toilet and shower facilities. And under the definition being proposed tonight, um, these tenants would share a common kitchen located elsewhere in the building, and they might share that kitchen with uh, more than just themselves. Um, another common SRO layout is to have individual one-room units with the sleeping and living areas, um, and then having the larger kitchen and bathroom amenities located outside of the unit, but on the same floor. So there might be one large restroom or one large common kitchen per floor. Um, and the bottom right is just what a, what a unit might look like. So these are just some, um, some additional things I wanted to note. So the physical form and layout, um, you might notice is similar to other uses such as a dormitory or hostel but they are a residential housing type meant to be rented out on a monthly basis or even potentially sold. Um, because they are typically small rooms with shared amenities, they might cost developers less to construct, which would allow them to pass savings on to future tenants um, via reduced rental rates. 
Um, and they are typically a more affordable housing type, but it doesn't always mean that they're officially income restricted. Um, in recent years, changing demographics and living preferences have led to the development of market rate SROs for those who simply prefer to live alone, um, don't want to have to maintain amenities. And this could include young professionals who spend a lot of time outside of their homes, um, or also seniors who live independently still, but they wish to downsize. Um, so it could accommodate a range of types of of people or um, different incomes. So I'm gonna summar uh, the next few slides will summarize the proposed, the specific text amendments. Um, there are two major changes, more significant changes. Um, first, the amendment of the definition of an SRO dwelling, and um, we're also proposing to expand the number of zoning districts where this type of use would be permitted. Um, there are also three minor amendments that are necessary um, just to maintain consistency throughout the code, but they're more housekeeping items, I'd say. So um, the first amendment is uh, the definition of single room occupancy dwelling. I did strike out the, the current definition. Um, it currently defines the SRO dwelling use more like a studio apartment, saying that each individual unit must be self-contained which means that all amenities would have to be located inside uh, the unit. Um, nothing would be shared, and each unit shall not exceed 500 square feet in size. Uh, this definition inhibits the development of true SRO housing, which typically includes the common kitchen or toilet facilities that are shared between tenants. Um, so we are proposing to fully amend this definition so it accurately reflects what the SRO use is. So the second um, amendment is a minor one, but we would need to amend the definition of dwelling um, because it does also um, say that a dwelling is self-contained with kitchen and bathroom facilities. Um, we would add language saying unless otherwise stipulated so that the SRO definition would kind of trump that. Um, and we also want to strike out apartment hotels because it's not found anywhere else in the code and it, um, the term could be confused with SRO dwellings. So we wanna take that out. So this is the second more significant amendment. Um, currently the zoning ordinance significantly limits where SRO dwellings can be located within the city. So we, um, on the left, we created a list of location criteria um, to identify additional zoning districts where the use could be appropriate. Um, they did include zoning districts with existing design standards in place, um, districts that already permit uses with similar characteristics or levels of intensity, um, districts that typically have close proximity to frequent public transit, uh, and districts that are, uh, permit or are typically located near a mix of uses, so um, residents could have accessibility to employment or other amenities by foot or bicycle. Um, we looked at all the, the zoning districts and came up with the list on the right. Um, I did want to note that SRO dwellings are already a permitted use in all TSA zones and in the FBUN2 form-based zoning district, um, but the rest would all be new additions. And this is just a citywide map showing where those zoning districts are located, so it would um, open it up to a larger part of the city. And so there are two more minor amendments being proposed. Um, this is just a small correction to the schedule of minimum off-street parking requirements. Um, currently, the, the SRO dwelling is kind of grouped in with multifamily dwellings. And um, we're proposing to make the SRO dwelling its own standalone residential use, so it wouldn't be a type of multifamily dwelling. It would be its own residential use. So we want to add that, um, put it in its own row under residential. Um, and we would maintain the same minimum required parking ratio, which would be one half space per individual unit. Um, we're also proposing to take out, there's a reference to a 600 square foot dimension, which uh, doesn't really correlate to anything in the code. So it's kind of, doesn't seem to, to really be necessary. Um, and this is a last small amendment, the last one. Um, but the D3 zoning district includes a set of provisions that are meant 
to ensure that mixed use developments provide for on-site compatibility and neighborhood compatibility. Um, so one requirement states um, that buildings containing commercial or office uses above the second story shall incorporate multifamily dwellings, boarding houses, bed and breakfast or hotel uses um, for at least 50% of the total floor area of the building. We just wanna add single room occupancy dwellings. Um, we think that, that use, the SR dwelling use is similar to the other specific uses in this section. Um, so we wanna add it so the SR dwelling use would be permitted or encouraged in mixed use developments in the D3 zone. And just to wrap this up, I did wanna quickly um, address the growing SLC housing plan because it was the reason this petition was initiated. Um, so we could advance some of its goals and objectives. Um, this blurb, I think, kind of sums up the plan. Um, it outlines solutions for reaching a point where all residents, current and prospective, regardless of race, age, economic status, or physical ability, can find a place to call home. Um, the city's housing policy must address issues of affordability, creating long-term solutions for increasing the housing supply, expanding housing opportunities throughout the city, addressing systemic failures in the rental market, and preserving existing units. Um, these two specific goals that I think this petition directly addresses um, is increasing housing options by reforming city practices um, and also building a more equitable city. And it's staff's opinion these changes directly support these two goals. Um, we're modernizing the land use code and zoning regulations to reflect affordability needs and provide housing options for all income levels and also uh, different living preferences. So staff is recommending um, that the Planning Commission forwards a favorable recommendation to the City Council for their consideration. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. I have a question, if I could. Go for it. Um, how would this affect the RMF zones? Because I guess you said uh, the SROs will be taken out of RMF zones. So will RMF no longer be able to have SROs? So currently, the SRO dwelling is only permitted in TSA and in the FBUN2. So okay. um, we're not affecting RMF zones at all. Oh, we're at not all. proposing even. Okay, so they were never them. available to have them, and they still okay. And remind me one more time: TSA zones is how far away from the tracks again? A quarter mile, Wayne. So like, if it's 400 south, how far south and north would it go? Like two blocks? Or? I'm not. I feel like it differs. Um, yeah. It's a, a full block. Half a block, also. give or take. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was trying to figure out this definition. So, each unit consists of one combined living, which would be like a living room or yeah, and sleeping room. So, like, is this? Are, are we putting multiple people in in the same room? With these or is it single room occupancy in the sense of like it's one person per room but then they're sharing other amenities in the house like i'm trying to figure out is it similar to like if i get together with three or four of my friends and i rent out a house and i've got a house and each of us have our own room and then we share a kitchen or the common areas or is it different where it's like we're putting multiple people in each of those rooms and so maybe the three of us we're now putting six of us because we're all and then we're you know i mean help me understand yeah, so we're not stipulating how many people could be in a room, but they would still be held to um, the same requirement of a maximum of a, a family, or was it three, no more than three unrelated persons? Yeah, they're also gonna be regulated by building code. It's one thing that we didn't wanna do with this definition is over-regulate. We have a tendency to do that a lot. Um, and then when folks come in with a good proposal, we've kind of backed ourselves into a corner. We originally had a, statement in there that said it's for one or, or two people per room but we backed off of that because if we wanted to allow enough flexibility that if you made a big enough room to build building code and you could put three people in that room and have multiple rooms with three people and meet all their building code requirements and everything else you could still fall under that so sro that just really starts if you're, if you're putting that sort of I mean like like a hostel type thing um that people are living in a, for a longer term, that really ups the density drastically in a very small. Yeah, and the difference between this and a, a hostel situation is the, uh, 
this would be a 30 day this right. falls under the dwelling so it's, I'm a, saying, so it's a longer term that's right right so i mean that's, that's what i'm kind of getting at is it seems like you're really like like the place we just rezoned rmu 45 you're putting a giant hostel for students with like you know a big room that's got 20 people sleeping in it a living area and a study maybe a kitchen students are trying to like do, do like a mass student housing i could see the neighborhood being really really mad about that but each individual room would be held to either a family or no more than three unrelated people so i'm not sure if there's a potential for 20 unless they were because we've got no family. density requirements in the rmu <clears throat> zones right i mean those those are completely lifted so i think that's a that's a good comparison actually that neighborhood because there's several houses right across from the law school buildings that are sros they're just a big house with a common kitchen and lots of locked separate rooms so uh that, there's uh, no reason that it seems like there's no reason that this new development we saw earlier couldn't do the same and, and that structure i don't think i don't think that bothers me i think that probably fits fine in these zones it's more the structure of multiple people stacking them deep and stack you know really stacking people in these confined areas would that's basically what an sro is yeah but if you've got if you've got a room and it's a small room 10 by 10 right small bedroom um, but you could probably fit two two beds or bunks three um that's just different if you got one person there's only so many 10 by 10 rooms you put in the structure all of a sudden you get a lot of two people in those rooms which may lower the rent may that's a new goal and so then you're getting you're, you're getting twice to three times the occupancy in a pretty confined facility in which looking at the zoning map i mean uh these zones are all over the city and neighbor a lot of residential communities um it's also somewhat I'm sure we think that we think that Friendship Manor is upset about their parking or potentially driving through wait until no oh. so you know a bunch of a bunch of 10 by 10 rooms with two or three people in it are proposed it's it's somewhat limited by its parking right because you said that each unit would require one the minimum would be one half oh, one half per unit yes oh. would, would that make a difference if would there be a reduction if it's close uh, I mean, six it's, people, one parking yeah, spot. It's dense. It's really dense. Would there be a reduction uh, in parking if they were next to a transit station, like there is in other zoning districts? So our current parking ordinance, um, the minimum for that use is one half space per dwelling. Um, the maximums range based on zoning district, but the minimum I would stand at at one half. Um, I too am a little bit uncomfortable with um, this as a uh, the broadness of this um, because it if you look if you do look at the map which is on page 56 to 57 of our booklet there's a tremendous amount of central city area where um, this could have a tremendous effect uh, by conversion of of uh, large homes to SROs everywhere um, to bought to um, building as just as, as this property we just approved they could come back and as of right as of right and build you know I don't know how many units 8,000 times four stories you know um, 32,000 square feet they could build 80 or 90 units in that one spot that we just approved with just you know 40 parking spaces of course that's not gonna, they're not going to be able to put 40 parking spaces on the ground level but you know who says they have to put them on the ground level so that's you know that's a there's a danger there in really intensifying um, I, I don't think I mind it in one or two places but I don't know that we want to open the door to just any anybody anywhere doing this. I think it's very diff very difficult not to have the context of the neighborhood considered. Was there consideration to make it a conditional use in some zones? Um, we didn't. We're not proposing any of them to be conditional uses. 
Is that looked at at all as a possible way to perhaps limit some of the impact if it is in a more single family residential area or adjacent to? That is something that the Planning Commission can consider as a recommendation. Um, it is key to remember that, you know, conditional use process is a, through state code, they're essentially still an allowed use yeah. um, unless the impacts can't be mitigated. But that is something that the Planning Commission certainly can recommend to the City Council if they think that there's, there might be certain impacts in certain zoning districts. Is there any estimation in perhaps in the, f the five year housing plan or, or anything that anyone's done that would suggest the impact of this to the densification, like percentage increase and in how many more units we'd be expecting from this policy? Uh, no, I don't believe any studies like that have been done. Hmm. Uh, this is a public hearing, so we can quickly do that if everyone wants to think for a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead and uh, open the public hearing on this matter. If anyone would like to speak, come on up. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Can I uh, uh, offer a, a recommendation? Um, just looking at the, the text, uh, the proposed amendment to the term dwelling, um, unless otherwise stipulated in this chapter is proposed to be added. A um, couple of things with that. Stipulated generally indicates an agreement, I would say, unless otherwise stated or specified, and I would say in this title, so that it covers all of 21A. Um, the other thing that that particular language does is it modifies everything in front of it, which would include occupancy on a monthly basis. And I'm a little bit concerned given all the conversation that we have about short-term rentals in the city that um, we might want to specifically tie that to short-term, or not short-term, but uh, to single room occupancy so that it's not every kind of dwelling um, unless otherwise specified it would be unless otherwise specified for a short, or I keep saying short term, for a single room occupancy use, something like that. Um, maybe if, if the commission uh, forwards a positive recommendation, you could give me a little bit of latitude to, um, to wordsmith that. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, I'm grappling with uh, Knowing we have this housing crisis and we have this crisis in affordability that we have to step out of our comfort zone a lot, I think, in some regards, of how we want to propose solutions. But I think the transitory nature of an SRO, because it's a monthly, you don't expect them there that long, does create the potential for um, conflict with our single family residential areas. And this seems to be um, something that I want to embrace, but fits more in a in a district in a business district and not not such an impact because i felt like well the parking would limit its size but you would still have this constant revolving people in and out on a very short-term basis and i think that for me when i look at that compatibility that becomes more of a sticking point of how are we proposing solutions to our housing issues but in a way that f feels like it's still honoring those different nodes of communities. I'm, I'm envisioning just dormitories going in places. And I love the dorms when I lived in dorms. But God knows <laughs> I would not want one in my area. <laughs> but I mean, that's eventually what, essentially what I'm like. And, and, I, and I'm it trying seems to like think a lot of these the more like Think of the old boarding house. Yeah, but but it, okay. There's there's what you maybe could do, which is maybe what's happening on the U. And right. Where you share, where I'm saying I went and shared a house with a group of, with a few friends, versus what you could do or what developers could, could do. do. And I think that we've seen a lot of examples when what you could do comes before here, and it puts us in uncomfortable situations, um, because there are times that we don't have the tools to do anything about what's going on, um, and what you could do is a dormitory. Two people per room, ten by ten, little twin beds, two desks. The bathroom down the hall. Bathroom down the hall. Yeah. 
And I and that really so Matt, how with is no that, parking restrictions really. I mean very limited. So Matt, how is that different if it was an apartment and it was two people in an apartment? I'm just trying to say what what's the difference in how this would impact an area if it was an apartment versus an SRO? I think, I think it's just density. 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 The density is the number of people and then it's also the But how would that be different from an apartment? Wouldn't you have the same density? No, not necessarily. But, but I think this facilitates a higher level, higher level. Because if you can have three people per room, under the well, in, in an apartment, you've got to have a kitchen and a bathroom. An apartment shared, and so it's three people per the apartment unit, right. not just the room itself. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you can have three people to an apartment. You can get less apartments in a building than you could in SRO. I totally see that difference in in yeah. in, in ratcheting up that density. But um, I just. I don't know how, I don't know why it's so different from an apartment to an SRO. For me, the difference is the transitory part of yeah, it, I not necessarily yeah. how many rooms we can get in a building, well, but the transitory nature, because I think they function the same as, as an apartment would. Well, and again, I don't know how, how transitory are they going to be, just because they're, they're required to have a 30-day 30 30 rental. That doesn't mean that they're only going to have 30-day rentals. But if you're... It's going to be more just a super dense apartment building with less bathrooms or less kitchens. Is there that... a stipulation in health code on how many people per bathroom? Well, probably. Not, not only that, but there is <coughs> no minimum size. <laughs> There's no minimum size for the rooms either. Three unmarried people per unit. So that could be, you know, 200 square feet a room. And Three people could move in there, and you know, at three. So the the place that we were just talking about with five floors and eight thousand square feet, and you know, over a hundred and twenty units. Assuming they can get their parking garage on there, right? The ones that under, underground and shuffles the cars. <laughs> <laughs> right, the <coughs> elevator. You park. Mm -hmm. You're parking on every floor. Is the thirty day component? a key part of an SRO and or the five-year housing plan? Is that like, is that something that really addresses an issue? Or could there be something that lengthens that? Can you do, do we do that with apartments? Do apartments require a certain amount of? Yes, that's our definition of actual dwelling. Um, that's what distinguishes any any dwelling, whether it's a single family dwelling, multifamily dwelling, is it's, it, there, it's on a monthly basis. That's what distinguishes it from a short term rental, hotel, motel, those kind I of things. I gotcha. Awesome. So this is the same as any apartment? Same as any, okay. yeah, any dwelling unit. Hmm. What are those houses across from the stadium where you've got a house and they rent out rooms and they share bits, but they're not? Are those our SROs or are those just? I'm pretty sure they're SROs, yeah. I mean, I've been inside a few of them. They seem exactly like an SRO. So you, but they, they maybe rent them on a yearly basis, like you have a yearly yeah, or something. Yeah, I don't something. know what their contracts are, but. But I, I think those are privately run, right? I guess the owner rents versus a, con versus a you know, big building, I guess, that rents them. No, it's, they're not, they're, the building is owned by one person and they rent out the rooms, yeah. Right. And it's privately owned by. Like any of these so would there's be. kind of two conditions that we might be worried about. One is the conversion of larger dwelling units into SROs on a large scale that we that wouldn't be allowed now. Right, and so and I'm not we, sure where that would be exactly. But we would allow for a conversion of those larger units into apartments. Apartments. And I kind of feel like converting them to SROs is much more preferable. Because at some point you could easily, more easily convert them back if you had an owner that wanted to do that. Yes. Yeah. But that is one of the, one of the situations. Um, but the other situation is then a mad dash to build very high density uh, SRO projects. So maybe we need to suggest a maximum density? I mean, I'd be fine with a one, one person or family per bedroom. I mean, to me that accommodates, makes some progress in this direction without, you know, 
opening it up to what I think is both highly, really, really dense, and then also, um, you know, I'm even envisioning just slum lords like just packing yeah. people in. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, as bad as that sounds, but like just packing cheap rent. You know, here it is, and we're not gonna take care of it. Three people. Here's a bedroom. I mean, it's like, like I would even say like one per. I mean, one one person or family per bedroom. To me, at least, is a step in this direction without going full the full deal. I know you guys pulled it out, but yeah, I think there's there's got to be somewhere that differentiates these from just a a really dense apartment building with less amenities. Well, you're still getting denser because you're not building a kitchen and a bathroom. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Unit, I agree right? with you that there's there's a there's having limiting it to one person per room makes it so it can't Family, be just as there. dense as possible, but it's also more dense than an apartment. Is there anything from a policy directive that you've gotten that would push towards, you know, the, the necessity of having three families? or three people per room versus the one? I mean, obviously it puts a lot more people in there, but I mean, are we going, because you know, I agree with Amy that we're trying to address a housing problem, and so are we going to be addressing it in an aggressive way by going with Matt's suggestion? Yeah, so uh, like Wayne mentioned, we initially had, uh, we were proposing initially to limit it to one to two people per room. Um, we did, just get some feedback from other city divisions when they were making reviews that maybe, you know, we shouldn't have that language in there um, that the building code would kind of, because the building code, they're gonna be limited to that, to, to occupancy requirements. Um, so we did end up taking that out. We're not trying, our aim with this was to be as least prescriptive as possible. Um, but I don't think there's a reason why we so couldn't live. Actually, then in, in that regard, if the building occupancy is filled and so you have something with, we'll just say 10 units and but the building occupancy is reached in seven, then three have to be empty? Is that what? I'm assuming that the occupancy would be limited based on the design. Say it was a new construction SRO, the dimensions of the unit would probably dictate how many people could. So if you, way. but I was just thinking of the, the sum total, if you have 10, rooms but you've reached occupancy um you know you've reached the occupancy level with seven of those rooms then three would have to stay empty because you would only have a sum total for the building right i am not very great at building code but i believe it's based on kind of a living space area so it you is. could have so many per that one particular living space area right um, so it's not the whole building. It's not taking the square footage of an entire building. So you're it's saying like that the, the building code is is saying three. I, I mean, I guess what is the building code? Is it well, three unrelated? I, I think that's what we need to know. Yeah. Because if we don't know that, then we don't know the answer to this question. I mean, yes, if it is a 600 square foot unit and the building code allows up to four people, okay. If it's a 200 square foot unit, and we try to put four people in it, that's a whole different story. So uh, what, what, if we don't know what, that, what the answer to that is, it's a fire code, it's a fire code and occupancy situation, but it will be on the square footage, based on the square footage of the unit and its distance from fire exits and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of conditions that have to go into the design of the building to allow that kind of density. Right. And I think if we're looking at not putting in our own language, that knowing what that building code is is helpful. And it might, yeah. that might allay our concerns about how many people per room, if it's related to the size of the room. Um, and then we could, I would be more comfortable with not adding that language, but yeah, I don't know what that is. So I'm, I'm starting to feel a little concerned, and I, I, I'm not certain um, that we might be running into a Fair Housing Act problem, and it's something I would like to explore if you're going to limit um, the number of occupants uh, to the units. Well, I think, I think what Amy's saying is that we want to know what the code limits it to. And there's, yeah, there's a formula somewhere in the... 
microphone. <laughs> of course it is. Go to page 60 in the staff report to the building services comments. They talk about what the building code requires for occupancy. It says, um, <clears throat> an efficiency dwelling unit, which is a unit defined as having a living room of not less than 220 square feet of floor area and an additional 100 square feet for each additional occupant, provided with a kitchen and bathroom. And what, <clears throat> what this SRO proposal that Ashley has um, is suggesting that the unit has either a kitchen or a bathroom, but not both. So there's a, that's where the, the cost savings come in, in terms of the development aspect of it, for the affordability. So this is saying that the code is that for 220 square feet is for one person. And if you're gonna have another occupant, it needs to be 100 square feet for each additional occupant. Um, and provide with a kitchen and bathroom. So I'm pretty sure, I'm sorry to convolute things, but I'm pretty sure, because I spoke with the reviewer about this, um, because our current definition defines a studio apartment, he was wanting us to add um, a definition for an efficiency dwelling unit, which is a studio, which has a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, so I believe that this section of code refers to a, stu a self-contained studio apartment. Um, the standards might be similar for an SRO, but I can't confirm that. Recommendation. I can, I don't have a definitive answer on what the building code requirements are for an SRO when it comes to occupancy. But it, so, it sounds like, it. I mean, I mean, it's probably best that we get that precisely, but it's it's going to be it's got to be at least what 100 150 square feet per for the first family and 100 for each additional. Per yeah, person. and it sounds when I read this through again that in order to kind of consider the Fair Housing Act, it's limiting the number of occupants based on space, right? Not just based on unit. So it's taking into account like how big is it. And right. so I think that is a, a good approach, but I would like to, I don't know, Why? somehow to be able to have that in the code so that it's very definitive of what we're voting on. I mean, building services comment here actually is interesting. I mean, why was this, was this tried to be incorporated into this? I mean, it seems like they're saying that we should define it as congregate living facilities. Yeah. Which already has a place in the building code and then efficiency dwelling unit, which again is in the living code and already has these definitions. Why, why not match with the existing building code rather than, rather than form our own code? So oftentimes, building code definitions don't strictly follow zoning. I mean, that, that happens quite a bit. I mean, building code defines how you build something from a safety perspective, but we, we do it based on use. Um, is, or zoning does it based on use. So um, oftentimes it it's, gets difficult when we route things and we get our reviews from building services because they, and sometimes they're kind of looking at it from a building code perspective, but we're looking at it from a zoning perspective and it, con it has a tendency to convolute things a little bit. Um, we're just trying to define a specific use. We're trying to, we're trying to fill a hole in are allowable housing types in the city. Uh, right now, the way that our SOR defi SRO definition is, is stated, it, it doesn't really define an SRO, it defines a studio apartment, because it says every unit must be self-contained. It basically doesn't make any sense. Um, so we're, we're basically, we're trying, to, we're trying to fill that gap in the housing need within the city. Um, and there is some, you know, issues between building code and, and like this efficiency dwelling unit. You know, they would like us to add some things to try to help in their future reviews with other uses. And this happens a lot. It, it, people always want to build on our zoning code changes to fix other things. And it could make things a bit confusing. 
I just wanted to comment that. Okay, um, if you go ahead. I was just going to comment that uh, I did a quick Google search here of the definition of SRO by HUD, and they actually define it as a property that includes multiple single room dwelling units. Each unit is for occupancy by a single eligible individual. The unit, the unit need not, or the unit need not, but may contain food preparation or sanitary facilities or both. Hmm. A one, a one individual, and it could have a kitchen and a bathroom, or either one of those. Or, in, if we're looking at this building services zoning comment, I mean, they're saying if, in a way, we can't discriminate based on the number of occupants per room under hair for housing standards. But this line about where it says, you could say there has to be 100 square feet of <coughs> sleeping area per occupant. Under I mean, that's what he's kind of hinting at the efficiency dwelling unit, which has got its kind of common area of 220 square feet plus an additional 100 square feet for each individual occupant and provided with a kitchen and bathroom, and so. Then you at least be, you're not putting people in, you're not putting two or three people in 10 by 10 rooms. You're putting people in, putting one per, I mean, a 10 by 10 is a pretty small bedroom, but it's, um, so they're doing fine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you have, you have to have 100 square feet per occupant, seems to at least. Provide more option. I mean, at least give some some density block I, I have a sense just among, between us here that um, if this were more widely understood that half the city would be freaking out at the at the potential of having a single room occupant um, building you know converted or built next to them partly because of the tenure issue the I mean the length of the the transitory issue and partly because of the densities um, so I and I, I feel like we're that we're still dancing around how much whether there's really an issue with Matt's issue of overcrowding within a particular building slash unit and also overcrowding within a neighborhood as well potentially are SROs by nature more transitory than apartments? To Amy's point earlier, is it or is it essentially the same? Right. Yeah, I don't. I have. I don't have data on that, but I'm sure either. there's data available. So I did do some research, and uh, it definitely varies by city. Um, they choose to regulate them differently, um, and a lot of different aspects of them. So. Some cities do allow for less than you could stay nightly, like in New York City at an SRO, but um, we chose to, to maintain the 30-day minimum. Okay. <laughs> I think we need some more information about uh, how we define an SRO. Again, just Googling here real quick, there's 30 different entries on, on size by square footage and requirements here from all of the different listings and cities that are on the first page of Google, so. Why did we pick this particular definition? Uh, we wrote this definition uh, just based on a lot of research on different cities, how they define the use, how they regulate it. Um, this is what we chose, and like I said, um, we're trying to be as least prescriptive as possible because the building code is extremely prescriptive. Um, for an example, this is how they regulate a studio apartment, which is self-contained, but they do have minimum floor areas per occupant. Um, they'll have a minimum number of kitchens per total number of occupants using that kitchen. Um, under the congregate living facilities, there are a whole bunch of regulations that will um, determine the layout of, of the SRO. So we're, we just want to allow the use. We want to allow this type of housing. Um, the building code's going to determine, pretty much dictate how it, it ends up being designed. Um, under those circumstances, um, I'm, I think I'm, I'm thinking of proposing that we table this while we get that information from the building code so that we have a better idea of how that would actually work in practice here in Salt Lake under our own building codes, not somewhere else. 
Um, and I do think we ought to have a little bit more information on how the Fair Housing Act would uh, also uh, uh, work with this proposal. Um, I'd like to add also, if it's possible, um, it'd be nice to know, especially where there's so many areas of the city that this is being applied to. I don't know, I guess relatively it's not, but it's, it looks like a large area. Um, but maybe possibly how many properties this could be potentially applied to. Um, so are you, with that, are you, are you looking at every, I mean, just flat out the number of properties specified? In well, the zone obviously area? you guys know how many are in each of these zoning areas approximately, but then is there any way to get at, say, within a zoning area or within an area of the city that this is applied to how many, say, vacant lots or potential, potentially developable houses that could be divided into an SRO? I don't, I'm not I don't sure know. that we can pull that yeah. information I mean, out. What, what I think would be helpful is no. looking at, maybe if we were providing some recommendations on tiering the zoning, so now instead of just coming out and saying these are all the zones, so these are the ones that we definitely 100% would do. This ones we could consider. I mean, if we were to scale the zones back a little bit, which ones would we scale back and why? Or maybe we don't scale them back and you completely disagree with that point of scaling anything back. Our, and that would be fine. And We've and, reviewed and, this for quite some time, and this is what we came up with as our proposal. Um, so to kind of ask us to go back and scale back without any sort of criteria we would want to know what the commission particularly, is particularly reducing at. its impact on districts that neighbor single family districts people single family residential districts you, you did mention that um, this was not affecting the multifamily right it's not affecting the multifamily just everywhere else besides multifamily not RMF um, it's not it's not affecting every zoning district just the list the one that's right here. Okay. This list, yeah, on the right. So and some all the, of the mixed use. And, and all the colored spaces on the map, right? Those are all the yes. that's in here. Those are yeah. all in And I think it is important to recognize when you look at that list, Ashley, that you know, we're not touching the RMF zones. We're not touching those zones where it's you know, strictly multifamily. That's not in the proposal. When you look at those districts, those are all zoning districts that allow a mix of uses. Um, that don't have density limitations in place. Um, so it, they all have very similar characteristics as of what this proposal would be. Um, the other thing I think would be helpful is to review other city definitions and how those have worked in those cities. Mm. So I'd like to not, rather, I mean, I can get your recommendation, but like if you could present how a few other major cities, you know, that are in our similar size, you know, I mean, New York obviously is one, I'm sure they've got one, but you know, if we're looking at Denver or Boise or Oregon or you know, Portland or, you know, looking at other cities that we have that they have enacted this stuff at their code, at their language and, and what that, how that's worked in their city, I think would be a helpful perspective um, to see. Could you elaborate on how it worked? Cause that might be kind of hard to, to get any information on. Um, Seems like it seems like we've seen something like that with, with um, not SROs, but the uh, accessory dwelling units where there was some analysis done about how it had worked out in other cities and in our city since imp implementation. I don't know if there's anything, like any recent implementation of this out there that you could look at and, okay. or talk to that city. And these under, we, under this definition, you know, that it's got the one per occupant or whatever, you know, this is where they've kind of been developed and these are the zones for which the city provides it to and they do tend to neighbor single family residential or they don't and, you know, and, and cities are particularly our peers would be, I think, I think helpful. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm guessing that most of these would probably pop up in college areas, uh, I'm assuming, but you know. Find out where they're at. Yeah. So both where they're both permitted, where they're permitted, then also where they actually where they end up would be helpful in other cities. So maybe maybe at our map we're only that's looking at. That's a pretty at, extensive study. I have. Yeah, to, that would be. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of as work. As a re researcher, I have to warn you that that's yeah. a, that's All a right. pretty extensive. All right, I'll roll back study. on that one then. Well, even one case example would be good, and if we can find one that's actually been done, not mm -hmm. that we don't have to do ourselves, that would be great. And I'm sure that they're 
there are those kinds of things. Maybe we do look at this, the only place they really end up is right around the university and there's just that little bit of that node that is in, you know, where the market moves it to. That would be helpful to get an understanding of. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. Uh, I motion that the Planning Commission table, hold on, let me get the, uh, table PLN PCM 2018 uh, and ask staff to come back with additional information regarding how other cities have defined SROs and how those have been implemented in those communities, uh, how building codes within Salt Lake City provide restrictions on density and occupancy in the areas, uh, how looking at reducing the impact near single family districts or how you know what you know what that would be that uh, where where proposed districts neighbor single family districts and what we want to look at there and then how this proposal uh, overlays along with the occupancy sort of restrictions overlays with the fair housing act um, uh, make sure we're following that that correctly understanding good paul wayne <laughs> okay yeah. All right, so moved by Matt. I'll second. Seconded by Carolyn. Any other discussion? Okay, Clark? Aye. Andreas? Aye. Maureen? Yes. Carolyn? I agree. Matt? Yes. Amy? Yes. Brenda? Yes. All right, thank you for your work on that. We'll see you again soon. And that's it for today.